Okay, Boker Tov. Today's daf is daf Ayin, 70, and we pick up at the top, and we're dealing with, um, we're continuing to dealing with cases about when you have to be concerned, issues about supervision, and when you have to be concerned that the non-Jew might touch the wine or swap it for other wine or so, or, or similar. So now, um, um, we pick up with three lines from the top of daf Ayin. Who based the Havayasi Bey Hamad Yisrael? There was a house that had wine owned by a Jew in it. Allah, we could call him Achta Ladasha. Non Jew came in and locked the door. You remember, one of the concerns of leaving the non Jew in the store was even if you didn't tell him when you're coming back, maybe he'll lock the door. But the assumption would be, presumably, that if he would lock the door, that would raise concerns. If he has, as long as he hasn't locked the door, you're Okay, maybe. Anyway, here we have a case where he did lock the door. So maybe we Dafka should be concerned that he went ahead and he touched the wine or he did something with the wine. So um he uh, he uh, locked the door, he closed the door in the fra- in the face of the Jew. But there was a crack in the door. And once they got in, they found that the non Jew was there amongst the barrels. Amar Rava said Rava. Any any barrels that are opposite the crack that you could look into the crack and see are okay. Uh, presumably that means even if you didn't look into the crack, but presumably it means he knew of the crack and therefore he would have avo- avoided manipulating them. That's what I'm guessing. Um, uh, the high geese for the high geese, but on either side of the crack where you didn't have an, a line of sight, usher is forbidden. Okay, so basically it means he locked the door. You do have to be concerned. What was he doing there behind the locked door, right? And therefore, it's an issue. Um, one wonders what would be the story if he wasn't found among the barrels. Let's say he locked the door, and then by the time you got in, you found him, I don't know, raiding your fridge or watching TV, you know? So uh, how much is being found among the barrels part of what makes it a problem? Whereas the Kiddush, even though he's found among the barrels, anything that's opposite the crack in the door is okay. All right, so now the Gemara continues. Um, similar types of story. Um, uh, there was wine owned by a Jew that was in a house, and the Jew was in the top story of the house, and the non-Jew in the bottom story. And the way Rashi tells it, the wine was actually in the bottom story. But since the Jew could at any time, you know, I don't know, maybe there was like a balcony or something like that, you know, um, he could, uh, you know, he could look down and see it. Um, that meant that the wine would always be okay because the non-Jew would always be afraid that the Jew might be checking in. Okay, that's the normal case. But then what happened? Um, Shamu called Tigra. They heard the sound of some fighting outside, so they ran out to see what was going on. Nafik, they, Nafki, they went out. Now, after whatever that fracas resolved itself, the non-Jew went back into the home, and he went in you know, quickly, and he locked the door. So now he's alone with the wine behind a locked door. Do we have to say that the wine is a problem? So Amar Rava said, Rava, Chamer Shari, the wine's permissible. Mimer Amar, he said, because the non-Jew presumably will think to himself, Ki to Kadim Asai Ana, the same way I quickly went back into the home. Um, therefore, Kadim Asavasi Yisrael, Yossi Belyona, maybe my Jewish, uh, you know, uh, roommate or whatever, the you know, apartment uh, housemate. Um, also, you know, uh, you know, uh, ran back in after the fight, and for all I know, he's back up in his, in, you know, in in in, on, in his story of the house. So therefore, since there's a reasonable reason, I mean, again, you know, one always wonders what if the case is different? What if he sees that the Jew went to get the police or something? You know, whatever the case might be. But anyway, but even though the point is similar to the issue of the crack. And even if in reality nobody was looking into the crack, and even if in reality the Jew didn't go in, if it's reasonable that the non-Jew would have, uh, you know, could have, you know, would have reasonably thought, hey, just because I think I got in first doesn't mean I, I did, doesn't mean the Jew isn't there as well, that's enough to say that he would be concerned and not handle the wine. And he's maybe still sitting up there and, and, and observing me. Okay, third case. Hushbiza, there was an inn. That the wine owned by a Jew was in the inn. Okay. And there was a, the non Jew was there um, amongst the barrels. So, a straight case, the door wasn't locked, and so on. So, what's the story? Um, 
So presumably now, is, so he, Rava says, I'm a Rava, shari, below Aser. If he would have been, been discovered and, um, and had he been discovered sort of stealing the wine, he would have gotten in trouble, okay, then it's permissible. If he would have been, you know, if, if he would have been discovered mishandling the wine, if that would have meant that there would have been consequences, then the wine is permissible. Then you could say that his concern that he'll be discovered is enough to keep him off. But if, were he to be discovered, I don't know, stealing the wine, A, maybe Rashi says, you know, an earlier Rashi says, maybe he's got an in with the government and people would look the other way and, and ha ha, this guy's an innkeeper, whatever. Anyway, you know, this is a powerful person or whatever, and even if, you know, he's found manipulating Jewish wine, they just say, yeah, it's the Jews, whatever, you know, they would turn the other cheek or, um, you know, or let's say he has some reasonable excuse. Oh, no, I was just checking to make sure the wine hadn't gone bad or da 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 Anyway, if there's a way he would get away with it, even if he was discovered handling the wine, then the wine is forbidden. Then you have to assume that he did handle the wine and he figured he could get away with it. Okay, but if, had he... Worry not not to be discovered amongst the barrels. Worry to be discovered actually going and accessing the wine itself. He would get in trouble. Then even though he was among the barrels, you have to assume it's all okay. You're, you're allowed to assume it's all okay, which is uh, you know pretty funny because we all know that there are people that all the time are stealing things or whatever, and they would get in trouble if they were discovered. But they're desperate, you know, for food. They're hungry, whatever they might be. Okay, but nevertheless, this is sort of the principle that we're going to use, which is is that even though it's a case where maybe he's not afraid, you know, it, it gets back to sort of the cases of our Mishnah, right? Remember the cases of our Mishnah. That if you don't know that the Jew is away for a long time, then uh, it's okay because he's afraid the Jew will pop back in. So that idea of being afraid that the Jew will pop back in is here being sort of clarified, described as if he were discovered, he would get in trouble. Okay, so even though it's in the inn and maybe he's also staying in the inn and he has a right to be in this room or whatever, nevertheless, uh, and then you come back and you find him amongst the barrels, you are allowed to assume it's okay because if he's concerned that people could drop in at any time and there's a reasonable reason to be concerned that if he was discovered, he'd get in trouble, then it's considered to be okay. So that's the important principle of Nitva Salav Kiganev. Okay, so now we're going to keep on with similar cases. Let's take a look. Um, okay, so so that in a way really is just an illustration of the Mishnah, afraid to get caught, afraid somebody might drop in, and then you'll get caught and you'll get be in trouble. Um, so now the Gemara says like say, if in Ganesh, with the Brit does, does hit the, the, the hat burns on the head of the Ganesh. Okay. He's always aware of it. Okay. Who based it of Now there was a house that had some wine in it. And now you found the non Jew amongst the barrels. I guess part of the reason this is a chiddush added to the Mishnah is that he actually was there right between the barrels. Okay, and even so, Nitzvah Kaganov means it's okay. I'm a Rava, so If he has an excuse what he's doing in the house, the wine is forbidden. Below Hamar Shari, and if not, the one is permissible. Now Rashi says it sounds very similar to the previous case. Rashi says Isle Lishtamute is different than Nitvaslav Kigana. Isle Lishtamute is an excuse. What are you doing here in this house altogether? Why are you in this room where my wine is being kept? Even if you weren't handling the actual wine itself. So here's the question, okay? Which is why, if he, let's say he's got an excuse why he's in that room. Okay, no, I was in this room because I thought, I don't know, who knows? I thought I heard a mouse. I was in this room because I needed it to get access to the bathroom. The bathroom's on the other side of the room, or something like that. Then, then Rava said that it would be forbidden. Now the question is, why is it forbidden? Maybe it's still a case of Nitfa Solav Kiganov, okay? Again, Rashi, it's not clear in the Gemara, but I want to make this clear. There's two stages, right? One is, right now. Okay, so here's the room. Here are all the barrels of wine, right? Here's the non-Jew that happens to be amongst the barrels. So there's two questions. Why are you here? That's question number one. And the question is, does it isle ishtamute? Isle ishtamute. Does he have ishtamute? Am I spelling it right? Anyway, does he have an excuse why you're here? Okay. 
And then scenario number two is, that's scenario number one. Scenario number two is, is that there he is, and he actually is sticking his hand into the barrel, okay? And then the question there is, right, the question with that is, you know, why, not why are you, but, you know, you're taking my wine. Uh, and then it's the question of nitfas kiganov. Will he get in trouble for taking the wine or not? Is he a type of person that will get in trouble and maybe he even has an excuse why he's actually taking the wine? Okay, so normally we say that if you are a nitfas kiganov, you're going to be okay, okay? Here, though, the Gemara, uh, uh, here, though, the Gemara, Rashi, the Gemara says that if the question is, what are you doing there? So if he has an excuse why he's there, okay, it's going to be, um, it's the wine is going to be no good. If it's Isle Lishamute, then the wine is no good. So Rashi asks a question. Rashi says, I don't understand. So even if he doesn't have an excuse why he's there, why is the wine no good? If he would be in a case where he would be Nitzvah Kaganov, the wine should be good, right? You, you sort of see, well, one person says, why are you there? If you don't have a good excuse why you're there, then the wine is no good. Why is that true? Normally we say that as long as you would get in trouble if you actually were caught stealing the wine, you'd be okay. So the difference Rashi says is, is that here, this case is the case where you have a right to be in the room. All the cases until now were cases where I left the non-Jew in my store, the non-Jew shares my, you know, we're in the same inn, we're in the same building together, all those types of cases. If he's got a right to be there, okay, then as long as he, he'll get in trouble if he sticks his hand in, um, up until that point, he's, everything he's doing is okay. So you just, the basic rule is you don't want to get in trouble. So in this case, he's totally okay. And if he'll get in trouble by sticking his hand in, then I know that the wine will be good. But here, he has no right to be in this room to begin with. And, he, if, he, and if he has no good excuse why he's in this room and he's still willing to be in this room, then that means he's already willing to get into trouble. Okay, and since he's already, I mean, maybe that's the easiest way to say this. As long as he's in a position where he's willing to get into trouble, okay, then the wine is no good. Once he's willing to get into trouble, you have to be afraid you don't know what he did. So if he had a right to be in the room, okay, as long as he'll get in trouble if he sticks his hand in the barrel of wine, and there's nothing he's done that shows that he's prepared to get into trouble, then the wine remains good. But if he has no right to be in the room, and he has no excuse why he's in the room, and he's still in the room, okay, then, his lo then he shows that he's willing to get into trouble. So since he's shown that he's willing to get into trouble, the wine is no good. I don't know if I made it. Was that pretty clear? All right. So Islay Lich Damute is different than Nitzvah Salav Kaganev. The bot bottom line is, is that if he's, if he's shown that he's willing to get into trouble, okay, the wine is no good. So now the Gemara says like this. Now it's permissible. So Mace, I'll ask you, Nina La Pundak, O Shamalo Shamur Asur. You left the non-Jew with the uh with with your store and you locked the store, and maybe I don't know, you gave Pundak's him the keys. Is in, what? Pundak. Pundak is an inn, thank you, right. Okay. Thank you, sorry. You you know, and you locked the inn, but maybe you gave him the keys, or you said, Hey. I'm leaving, stay outside and make sure nobody goes in, okay? And there's wine inside. So he's sort of left alone, but he doesn't have a right to go inside. In that case, it's forbidden, okay? So why is it forbidden? Um, you know, so my law doesn't, I mean, even if he has, because even though he has no excuse why he is, you know, why he, and, and presumably then you found him among the wine, that part is not missing. So why is it forbidden? Aren't we talking about a case where he has no excuse to be inside and nevertheless the wine, uh, my love, Avagav the lace lady, he has no, wait a minute, did I get, hold on. Right, he has no excuse. Now I'm so totally confused. Hold on. I think I got the woman. I got to get to the He said, Lisa Mute. Right. So don't you see it is stricter? Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I got this confused. Hold on. Let me try this again. Oy. Hold on. Yeah, I think I said it wrong a minute ago. I'm sorry. Hold on a minute.
Yeah, I said it wrong a minute ago. Although maybe what I said made sense. I have to figure out why what I said didn't make sense, but I said it wrong. Okay. Rubba said, okay, I think I said it the reverse. I apologize. Rubba said, if you say if he has an excuse why he's here, if he can get if so he shouldn't be here, but if he has a way to excuse it, then the wine is forbidden. Then you figure he's up to no good, he's got a cover story, and the wine is forbidden. If he has an excuse, not a good reason. If he has an excuse, if he has a way to, you know, to get to, so if he has a, if he has a cover story, then the wine is forbidden. Ironically, if he has no excuse why he's here, so if he has no excuse why he's here, you would think that it's a bigger problem, right? If you yeah, actually that found it, make as much so that's why I got it reversed. I mean, maybe if he didn't go in and he has no excuse, you can assume he didn't go in. But if he actually did go in and he has no excuse. Then you would think you have to a more of a suspicion, which is why I got it reversed. Was the case that he was found among the wine or not among the wine? Let's take a look. One minute. Yeah, he was found among the wine. So I don't know. That's why I got it. That's why I got it reversed because it's a little bizarre. So let's read it again, though. I apologize. Let's read it again. Okay. Who So he's with the wine. I'm a If he has an excuse. Then Khamer Usr, the wine is forbidden because then you figure he's up to no good and he's got his cover story. And that's why the wine is forbidden. He shouldn't be in this room to begin with. If he low, if he doesn't have an excuse, then Khamer Shari, it's permissible. I think, oh, now I'm remembering. Rasi says, if he doesn't have an excuse, then he, that if he's got an excuse, he feels he can be in this room and spend all the time he needs because he always has an excuse. If he doesn't have an excuse, he's only here very briefly. But it might be he's only here only briefly, but if he doesn't have an excuse, he should all the more reason be concerned that he's up to no good. So it's very strange. Okay, if he's here without an excuse, you have to assume he did not have the leisure of taking his time. He needs to come in and come out quickly because he'll get in trouble. It's very bizarre. But if he's got an excuse, that's when you're afraid he's up to no good. Okay, so let's take a look. Mesa, in ala pundak, if the store is locked, oshamalo shmur asur. And you said, watch it, it's forbidden. And presumably, if then you found him among the wine. My love, I've got place of Bishtamute. Aren't we talking about a case where he doesn't have an excuse? And even so, the wine is forbidden, even though he doesn't have an excuse. And presumably, he won't uh, He won't tarry. No, did he say Bishtamute? No, it's when he has an excuse, and therefore you're afraid that he's going to tarry. So again, it's quite ironic. When he has an excuse, he's got a reason, an explanation why he's there. The wine is more forbidden. Okay, let's take the next case. A Jew and an Anju were sitting and drinking wine. Presumably they were drinking each one their own wine. Shem Yisrael called Tzuluye Beit Nishta. The Jew heard them that they were davening in the show. So he said, ah, it's Mincha time. Come Vazil. He got up and he left. And he left the Anju behind with the wine. And there's wine on the table, Jewish wine on the table. Amarava Chamra Shari. The wine is permissible. Neymar Amar Hashta Mitker Luhu Lechamre Bahadurasi says, Yeah, my fellow Jew, he's not my, my friend, the Jew there. He's not so from. He's going to remember he left wine here and he left, you know, and he left me alone with the wine. He's going to leave in the middle of Shimon Esri to come back and check on the wine. So, because of that, it's like the case in the Mishnah where you didn't tell him how long you were going. It's a great case, right? If you say, Oh, I got to run to Mincha, is that like you told him you were going to be away for a while and he feels that he's got the license <laughs> to do what he wants? And the Gemara's answer is no. He feels that you're not going to stay too long at davening, and you're going to come back to check in on him, and therefore he doesn't do what he wants. Okay, so that's why it's, it remains permissible. Um, okay, who Yisrael we can call him Davi Yasi Ba'arba. They were sitting in a boat. Sham Yisrael called Shipuri to beg Shimsha. Then he heard the sound of the sound of the shofar at evening time. Rashi says not here but elsewhere that the standard use of the word beishimshe means erev Shabbos. It's about to be nightfall for Shabbos, and they blew a shofar blast to know to know that you know Shabbos was about to start, like they do now in Yerushalayim. Navig Vazil, so he left. He went because to get ready for Shabbos. So now, the Jananju should feel, hey, I'm safe. This guy's got to get, get, you know, get dressed, go to show, make his Shabbos meal. I got a lot of time now, but all alone with the wine. So I'm a Rava. So Rava says, Chama Shari, the wine is permissible. Why? Because he'll say to himself, no, the Jew's going to remember he left me with all this wine. He's not going to trust me with this wine. And he'll come back and he'll check up on me. 
the evening from Shabbos, but one minute, why doesn't he say to himself, look, it's Shabbos, I got, you know, the guy's got to go have Shabbos meal with his family or whatever. Maybe he's not even allowed to come on the boat on Shabbos. He's not allowed to travel back here on Shabbos. I'm, I'm totally safe. Why doesn't he say that? So Hamar, Rava, I'm really Easter Giura. So Rava said, no, Easter Giura, Easter the Gear said to me, he avidan ba'ar miyusan, when I was still a non-Jew, Aminan, we used to say, you die lo mintri Shabbosah, Jews don't really keep Shabbos. Why? The Midri Shabsa, because if they really kept Shabbos, Kamakisa Kamishtakh Bashoka, we would find a lot of wallets in the marketplace because because you know that we'd see that they're in the marketplace to a minute before Shabbos, and then when it gets dark, if they were really serious about it, they would drop their wallets and they would leave. So obviously the sort of subtext here is it's not they don't keep it at all, but when it comes to protecting their money, they don't keep it. Okay. So those old canards, those old, you know, uh sort of uh, perceptions about Jews and money, whatever. I mean it's not being said explicitly here, but I think that's implicit. Yeah, when it comes to protect, keeping their wallets on them or protecting their money, they're not so careful about Shabbos. And therefore, the same is true by the wine. He knows that the Jew left to go keep Shabbos. But he also knows that the Jew left all these barrels of wine with me. Then, you know, the non Jews assume that when it comes to money, the Jews aren't going to be so careful about Shabbos. And that, that's good here because it means that the wine is permissible because he's always afraid that you will come back and check up on the wine. Is there now, a subtext here that, <clears throat> well, no, if this is his friend that he's drinking with, the friend isn't going to go out of his way to, to ruin the guy's wine, oh. but they can't say that? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know if in any of these stories, I mean, it is true when they're sitting and drinking wine together, you assume that they're friends or at least friendly, but yeah, but uh, all these stories are mostly done to explain how you, the wine still remains permissible without them specifically being about the case of friends, right? There's all these other cases yeah. where it's not that. So I don't know. But this just seems so right far fetched. Yeah, that they yeah. would that 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 they really think that their guy is going to come back during Shabbos. But that's what the Gemara seems to be claiming. I mean, to me, it's more the the opposite. These like non -Jew, these uh, Jewish these stereotypes about Jews. Um, and I said, it's present if this is still Issachar speaking or the Gemara speaking. I at that time wasn't aware that the reason the Jews we, they don't leave their wallets in the marketplace on Shabbos. The sphere line that we hold, Reb Yitzchak, Dam Reb Yitzchak, Hamotzi Kis B'Shabbos, Malicha Pachas Pachas Me'ar Ba'Amos, that the rabbis actually gave away that you wouldn't be caught with your wallet on Shabbos, you know, and have to drop it in the middle of the marketplace. That you can slowly walk less than four amot. I mean, I don't know how you deal with the mukta issue either. Maybe it's already on you, so it's it's already in your pocket. You're not directly manipulating it in terms of the mukta issue. Anyway, so they gave a special allowance, and Dafka, the reason the rabbis gave the special allowance that you could do it slowly, move it without technically carrying it, you know, each sort of advance is less than four amos, where specifically the irony is, is why do the rabbis allow it? Normally they don't let you carry things in this tricky way, you know, multiple steps less than four amos. And the reason is that they knew that if they didn't allow you, you would break Shabbos because you'd be concerned about your money. So in a way, it's a, like, it's actually true. We are concerned that Jews will break Shabbos if it's an issue of their money. So we had to find a way to allow it. But now, technically, they're not breaking Shabbos. But because the non-Jews have it's, it's some perception of this reality about our anxiety around our money and dealing with the challenges of that in Shabbos, the wine remains okay. Okay, so now the Gemara says like this. Who are you? There's a lion, Davi Noim Bimatsarta, that was roaring in the uh, wine press. Okay. Shama Ovikochovim, so in the non Jew heard, Tosha Baini Dani, and he went to where the barrels were and he hid among the barrels. So do we have to be afraid that while he's hiding among the barrels, I don't know, he's drinking some wine or he's to calm his nerves or he's doing some mm -hmm. Nisa? So Amar Rava, Chamer Shari, the wine is permissible. Memer Amar Kiechi to Tashina Ana, Ichanami Yisrael, Yisrael, Achorai. The same way I'm hiding in the barrels, the, the Jews are hiding in the barrels from this white wine, because they'll be watching me. Okay. Hanu Ganvi, so all these different ways in which even though the non Jew is among the barrels, you don't have to be afraid that he manipulated the wine. Hanu Ganvi, the Salki Pupadisa. There were some Ganovim that came to Pupadisa. And they opened up a lot of barrels of wine to drink the wine or to whatever they were doing. So Amarava Chamashari, the wine is permissible. Why? My Taima, Ruba Ganvi Yisrael Ninu. 
most Ganavim are Yisrael. Don't let this line out. Okay, you know, we always are concerned about the fact that the Gemara has all these negative sort of stereotypes about non-Jews, and a lot of that was in our Masechet. So now we've got, number one, a stereotype that Jews will break Shabbos for money, and now we got a line that most Ganavim are Jewish. Now, of course, that's a little bizarre, because the Jews are a tiny percentage of the world population. So if you look at the side, it says, Kirish, <laughs> that Rava was talking about where he lived, in Mechusa. In Mechusa, the majority of people in Mechusa, like, the majority of people in Mechusa were, um, were were Jews, and therefore what Rav is saying is, oh, that's lovely. And what Rav is saying is, is that um, here in Mechusa, don't assume, oh, the, you know, it's only the non-Jews are Ganovim. No, the majority of the population is Jewish, and the majority of the Ganovim are also going to be Jewish. Okay, and therefore you can assume that these Ganovim were Jews, and they were the ones that handled the wine. Rav didn't get along so well with the people of Mechusa in general. Okay, <laughs> willing to call them, them Ganovim. Or anyway, it's certainly it's say that if there's Ganovim, it's most likely here that they're from that they're Jewish. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, now, there was a story in Naharda. In Naharda, it's not true that the majority are Jewish. The majority are non-Jews. The wine is permissible, even though Ganavim came in and they opened barrels of wine. Why? Is this going like Rabbi Eliezer that says, like, that if there's a doubt if the person entered, it's permissive. It's Tahor. What does this mean? This is about the principle that Suffolk Tumor Berishu Tarabim, if you have a doubt if somebody touched something Tameh, if it's in the public domain, it's, ta it's Tahor. If it's in a private domain, it's Tameh. Okay, now here's the case. Not. Nah. We taught in Mishnah. You're going into a valley during the rainy season, and in the rainy season, a, va a valley of all these fields that are planted with wheat is considered to be Rishut HaYachid, because the owners do not like you trampling on their fields. A, a lot of people aren't traveling on the roads in, in the rainy season, and B, the owners don't like you trampling on their fields. So it's Rishut HaYachid. Okay, and in one of those fields, a, a body is buried. We know where the bodies are buried. Okay, but we don't know where the bodies are buried. So anyway, so it's a Rishud HaYachid. You don't know if you entered into the field where the body is buried. Should we say it's a case of Suffolk Tumar Bir Rishud HaYachid in your Tameh? So the halacha is, and there's a body buried in a certain field. I went into the valley. The any of them nichnasi sadeh. It's not like I went into the field and I don't know if I walked over the body. I don't even know if I went into the right the field where the body was buried. So is that a case of suffix to Marbir Shurta Yahid or not? So Imlo Nichnas, if I did not go. Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Safik Piatora, that case are actually Tahor, because you don't even know if you went into the region where the body was. Now, the question is, how do you define the region, right? What defines a field? Ownership? So if a person owns a thousand acres, that is, that you know, as opposed to different owners of different things, so it's not exactly clear how you define it. But he basically says, if you know you're in the region and you don't know you're touched, you touched it, that's where we say, Safik Tumar Bershuri Yachid is Tameh. But if you don't know if you entered into the field itself, then you're like one degree removed, then you're tahor. Savik biya tahor, savik magad tameh. So is that, so, so we're saying, how is that comparable here? It's comparable in the following way, that you, you don't know, why do we say the wine is okay? They opened up the wine, maybe they touched it, we should say the possibility that they touched it, it's sort of similar, the same way by Rishut Yachid, Suffolk, if you touch the Tuma, you're Tameh. Suffolk, if a non -Jew, all these cases, you don't know for sure the non you touched the wine, right? All these cases is the wine is a problem when there's a possibility you touched the wine, if you can't discount that possibility. So why don't we say Suffolk, he touched the wine. So maybe this is like Rebbe Eliezer, why? Because maybe it's like a case of sort of like Suffolk Bia. You don't even know if they entered in, why? They did open the barrels. But okay, even if most of the Ganavim are, Jew, are non Jews, maybe some of the Ganavim are Jews. So therefore, you don't know if a non Jew actually opened the barrel. If you know a non Jew opened the barrel, then it's a case of Suffolk Maga, and it's Tameh. You don't know if he touched it. But if you don't know if a non Jew even opened the barrel, maybe the barrel was open from before, maybe a Jewish Ghan have opened the barrel, and so on, that should be a case of Suffolk Bia, and we should say Tahor. It's okay. So maybe that's the reason it should be okay. Are we saying that this is like Rebbe Yehuda, Rebbe Eliezer? So the Gemara says, no, not necessarily. Shani hasam, the kima the itcha the patchi wushu mamona havilus fex feka. No, there, even if a non-Jew opened it, it's not a question of there was a definite bia. Let's say the non-Jew. We're going to assume all the ganavim are non-Jews. The non-Jew definitely opened it, so he definitely was present. So why then is it okay? 
It's okay because even though he was present, there's a double doubt. What's the double doubt? The double doubt is maybe normally, even under normal circumstances, you would say maybe he touched it, maybe he did. I mean, I'm reading this a little different than Rashi. I'll tell you how Rashi is in there. Maybe he touched it, maybe he didn't touch it, even though he opened it. But here, there's another reason to say he didn't touch it. Because they're going to it. They're not interested in wine. They're opening barrels to see maybe that's where you stored your cash. So therefore, because they're interested in looking for money and they're not interested in the wine, that creates a double doubt. The double doubt is, I mean, it's not exactly clear in the The way I'll say the double doubt is, maybe, you know, he, um, you know, well, I guess this is why Rashi says, because maybe he touched it, maybe he didn't touch it. And it's actually not a double doubt because there's just two reasons why he didn't touch it. Maybe he didn't get around to touching it and maybe he didn't touch it because he was looking for cash. So Rashi actually says the double doubt is what I was sort of saying before. Maybe he was Jewish, maybe he's not Jewish. And even if you think he's not Jewish, maybe he didn't touch it. Why didn't he touch it? If it's wine, if he's looking for wine, he definitely touched it. The reason he didn't touch it is because maybe he's not looking for wine. He's looking for cash, okay? So basically the idea is, is that is that now the, the thing is that Tosa says that it's not re really that different than the case of Suffolk Bi, right? Because the same case of Suffolk Bi is also essentially a double down. If here are all the fields and there's a body under one of them, and this guy doesn't know which field he went into, okay, it's sort of like a double down. Maybe I went into that field, and even if I didn't, if, and even if I maybe I didn't, and even if I did go into the field, maybe I walked over the dead body, maybe I didn't walk over the dead body. So that essentially is, this is the way Tosus explains, is the way the Gemara is explaining the suffix B of Rebbe Eliezer, that there's a two degree, two like degrees removed, okay? And here by comparable, it's a double doubt. Maybe the person who opened the barrel was Jewish, maybe not Jewish. Even if he was not Jewish, I don't assume he definitely touched the wine because he was interested in money. He wasn't interested in wine. So he saw it was wine and maybe he moved on. Okay? All right. So let's take a look. We'll come back to a case like that in a little bit. There was a young girl that was found among the barrels of wine, non-Jewish. And she had some wine froth in her hand. So should you assume that meant she definitely stuck her hand in the barrel to get off the wine froth? The wine's permissible. She probably took it from the back of the barrel of the wine. She didn't stick her hand in the barrel. It was on the sides of the barrel. The Avagav Deleka um, Deleka too, even though there's no more froth on the sides of the barrel, so we should assume that it was from in the barrel, not the sides. No. We should assume that it's just by chance that there was just a little froth and that's what she got in her hands, and that's what we really assume rather than assuming she stuck her hand in it. So all these, some of this is starting to get a little suspicious, right? Because it does sound like, really, that's more likely that it was on the outside, not the inside. So Rashi also throws in the fact that she's just a, a, a young girl, and therefore we don't assume that even if she's touching wine, she has in her mind to use it in a Vodazara type of a context. Okay, you might remember that from before. There was a discussion of, ch of children who don't yet, are not yet aware, like know the type of a Vodazara context, and that makes it more lenient. All right, next case. Hahu um, Pumusa, there was a certain troop, or Rashi says like a general of a troop, because the word Pumus, right, is the word like polemic. It means a fight. It means a war. Pumas means a war. So Pumas also means like a general or something. Okay? So a troop, a head of a troop, the Salik Linarda came to Narda. Pitchu Chavita Tuva. They opened up a lot of barrels. We're back to that. Kiyazar Ravdimi Amar, when this when, when Ravdimi said, Uvda Have coming to Rebel Lezer, a case like this just happened to Rebel Lezer. Fashara, and he permitted it. Now, why? Why don't we say, as opposed to the case before about Ganavim, where we could say there were non Jewish Ganavim, maybe we, we should presumably assume that the troops are, I mean, that there were Jewish Ganavim, here we should assume the troops are not Jewish. And if they open the barrels of wine, let's be afraid that they drank from it. So, I don't know why he permitted it. We're back to Rabbi Eliezer. If it's a doubt, if they entered in, it's Tahor. Now, again, it's not clear what the doubt is that they entered in. It sounds like that they opened the barrels of wine. Okay, which would be pretty interesting. Most of the people that go with these troops are Jews. Okay, why we should assume that? Okay, but anyway, but if you assume a majority of the soldiers are Jews, then you could assume that it was a Jew who opened the barrel of wine. Okay, so that's so one possibility to say it's okay is that the majority were Jews, which is a pretty funny assumption of fact, but if that's true, fine. But if the majority are not Jews, 
the Gemara now, this hopefully will clarify a little about what we discussed before. If the majority are not Jews, why do you call it Suffolk Bia? Before we called it Suffolk Bia, remember, because there were two doubts. Maybe it was a Jew, maybe it was a non-Jew, even if the majority are non-Jews. And even if it was a non-Jew, maybe they weren't interested in the wine because they were just interested in the cash. Right? Remember, that was the case before, why we considered it to be a double doubt. Okay, but here, if they're troops, presumably they're not there to steal. They're, they might be there to confiscate the food because they're hungry, but they're not there to steal. So if the majority are not Jewish, it's just, you know, it's like if a non-Jew opened it, he definitely t handled the wine. What's the issue? So Ihari says the Gemara, if that's true, has what do you mean it's a doubtful if they entered into the field? Like it's two, it's a double doubt. Suffolk Magahu, it's a single gout. Given the Miftah Tuva, I said, no. So the answer is no. If they had only opened one or two barrels of wine, I would say it's a single doubt. They're just thirsty and they're coming to take the wine. And the only doubt is, I don't know, maybe it was a Jew who opened it. But because they opened multiple barrels, given the Miftah Tuva, because they opened multiple barrels, even though they're troops, and normally I just assume troops are there to confiscate food, but why are they opening 20 barrels? They don't need 20 barrels. So it looks like they're also looking for money. And since it looks like they're also looking for money, I have a reason to say they didn't handle the wine. Okay, so basically this helps clarify the earlier issue. And we're basically back to is, is that if there's a double doubt, it's okay. And the double doubt is maybe Jew, maybe non-Jew. And even if it's a non-Jew, under normal circumstance, a non-Jew opens a barrel of wine, there's no doubt. You assume that they handle the wine. Why else are they opening it? But in the case that they're Ganovim, or in the case that they're troops and they're opening a lot of barrels, there's reason to think they're not interested in the wine. They're interested in looking for cash. And even if they opened it, maybe they didn't handle it. And since that would be the case, that's the you have that double doubt, and therefore the wine is okay. All right, so now the Gemara says like this. He seems yes. so much more <laughs> lenient. More lenient, whereas before, just catching the guy in the room when there's no evidence that he even opened, opened it. Opened it, that's problem. true. There he's just between the barrels and the barrels aren't even open. Although in most of those cases, we found ways to be okay, but the the, the, the flip of the side of the coin was, if he doesn't have an excuse, if he does have an excuse, whatever, it's no good, even though he's just among the barrels. <laughs> it's a good point. You know, maybe part of the issue has to also be here also is sort of the Sarche Rabim of the idea. They came into a town, right, and now what, we're gonna offer all the wine in the town or something like that? Like it sounds like, you know, it was a, a bigger communal need. But you are right, like the general question of the thrust is the thrust to find some excuse to say that it's okay. Cause like the case about like the, the froth or whatever, it's like, give me a break, really? Like, so you're right, the whole thrust of these cases is let's find some way to say it's okay, right? As opposed to some of the other ones were a little bit more complicated. But even there, I would say that it seems to be, well, I guess you're right. The chiddush here is, is that the barrels are open, you know, but like, um, yeah, I hear your point. I it hear your point. It almost seems like they start with this very principled right. humra, and then they're in moving practice. away from You're it. right. That does happen sometimes in the Gemara. Like, while the Gemara is dealing with the Mishnah, it seems to be very narrow, the allowance. And then when it starts dealing with real cases, you just see this very broad application. Eh, it's sure it's okay for this reason. So it's a good point. Like, maybe what we're really looking at is like is is you know his some historical development, and they just had a need to uh, you know to explain explain the allowances more expansively. It's a very good point. You're right. Um, yeah, because that definitely is the thrust of all of these stories. Okay, let's see another story. Musavisa the Masula Aklida. So there was a um, somebody who was like a uh, Rashi says a female uh, wine seller. Okay, from like the word Zolel Visove, like okay, and. Um, he gave the key to the door to the lock to the non-Jew, okay, um, and so and, and you know and to the wine cabinet. So now, what does she have to suspect about the wine behind the wine cabinet? I mean, maybe somebody said to her, "Hi, hey, you're not allowed to do that." Now he's got access to the wine. So I'm Reb Yitzchak, I'm Reb Lezer. Uvda have a bay This case was brought up in the base language. For Amru, La Masula Ella Shmiras Maftech Bavad. He was given the job to watch the key. He wasn't given the right to access the uh, you know, to access the liquor cabinet. You know, it's like hold on to my key. 
You're not, your job is not, I'm not telling you you can access it when you need to. No, you're just watching the key. So that's, again, pretty amazing. There he is. He's got, he's holding on to the key and we're not afraid that he accessed the liquor cabinet. Again, maybe that would sort of be a case about like Nitzvah Salav Kagada. He came back and said, hey, what are you doing opening the cabinet? I didn't tell you to do that. All right. So even though he's holding on to the key, that we're not afraid he accessed the cabinet. Um, we also thought similarly in a case by Taharos. Here again, the interesting thing of comparing Stam Yenam to the issue of Tahara and Tuma and touching things. We had it way back at the, you know, we had it at the beginning of this about, you know, about having your workers schlep your Tahar fruit and you have to be afraid that they touched it. So there's a lot of these comparisons of Tuma, Suffolk, if you touched it, making sure your the Ame Haaretz don't touch your Tahar stuff. <clears throat> the non-Jew doesn't touch the wine. The whole associations of non-Jews and Tuma also, you know, so there's like a lot of associations here. Okay, so Abai said, Avanan Amitanina, we taught similarly, Hamoser Maftechot Lama Aretz, if you gave over keys to an Ama Aretz of, of warehouses that had Tahor fruit in it, um, Tahorosa of Tahorot, they're Tahor, you don't have to be afraid that they touched it. With Fishal or Masal or Shmir's Maftech Gavad, they're just watching the keys, they don't have right to access it. <clears throat> and now Abai says, Hashet Torah, if we're going to be so lenient to allow even from the laws of Tumen Torah, how much more so should we be lenient by Yenesech? Which is pretty amazing. Which is like, what's exactly that hierarchy? He assumes that we, when it comes to the world of Tumen Torah, we're greater concerns and we would be more ready to say it's a problem than by Yenesech. Is it just that we attach more stringencies to Tumen Torah? Is it that by Tumen Torah, more people are Tamei, you know, the Ame Haaretz way outnumber the Chaverim or whatever, and maybe Adarabba because they don't treat it so weightily, maybe there's more of a likelihood. It doesn't explain why he thinks that. Is it because of the weight of that area of Halacha? Is it because of the circumstances and the likelihoods of touching and so on? But nevertheless, if I says we are more concerned of, you know, and more prepared to say that something became Tamei than we are to say it became Yenesach. And if even so we say when they're watching the keys, we don't assume the fruit became Tamei, we'll certainly say the same thing about wine. Okay? So the Gemara says, oh, so the Gemara says, Lememra, does that mean that this, this sounds like it's saying, the Taras are weightier than Yenesach. We're more ready to identify a problem with Taros than by wine. Um, in, yes, that's true, the Itmar, because it was taught. Chatzar Shechalka b'mispis. You have, you share a yard with a, um, and on the other, and, and on the neighboring yard is either a non-Jew or a Jew who's an Amaharet. So either it's a concern of wine or it's going to be a concern about Taharas. Okay? And you've got a boundary line. You have some low, like, bu bushes between the yards. Okay? So it's not impossible to cross over, but the guy can't say, oh, he accidentally is in your yard and he didn't realize. Because there's a, you know, there's a line of bushes or of like, or of like a low fence there or of rocks to, to demarcate hedges to demarcate the boundary line. Okay, Shechilka bin Mispis. Amaraf, Torah self tomato. If your neighbor is a, is, is a Jew who's an Amaretz, you have to be, you can't assume that that boundary line is going to stop him from crossing over. You're afraid he's going to cross over and he might handle your fruit and therefore it is Tamei. But for, but for a non Jew, you don't have to be concerned that he traveled over and he touched your wine and that the wine is Tamei. Again, not at all clear what the difference is. Is it just that one where we just, we, we consider the issue more serious and we're weightier about it? Is it that, uh, you know, an, I don't know. A non -Jew. Is it the circumstances somehow that a non-Jew who is less likely will handle your wine than your neighbor Jew will touch your fruit? Anyway, whatever the case might be, Rav says, where in that case, we will say that the we, we treat the issue of Tumatara more weightily, and we say your fruit is Tamei, but the wine is still okay. Okay? Rabbi Yochanan, and Rabbi Yochanan treats them equally. After Rosav to Horot. No, it's good enough for even for Tumantara. Okay, so it's not clear that he gives them any different weight. That boundary line is good enough to make sure that he's not, it's like a nitfa salaf kiganov type of a case, or lekalish damute, whatever the case might be. Since he has no excuse why he's in your yard, everything is okay, even for Tumantara. Mesve, I'll ask you on this. So now we're going to see, is this true that Rav's contention that Tumatara is weightier than Yein Nesach in terms of concerns of when it was handled? Mesve, hapnimis shochaver v'chitzona shalam ha'aretz. You've got a, um, a one courtyard behind another courtyard, okay? So you basically have here. Here's the main thoroughfare, okay? 
here is the outer courtyard, and then here's the inner one, okay? So anybody who lives in the inner courtyard is always going to travel through the outer one to get to the main thoroughfare. He's got a right to be in the outer courtyard. But anybody who lives in the outer courtyard has no right to be in the inner courtyard. What are you doing in my yard, okay? So, Haptimis Shel Chaver. The inner courtyard belongs to the Chaver, the one who's careful of Tumatala. Um, and the outer one belongs to the Yamaaret. So the Yamaaret says no excuse what he's doing in the inner courtyard. He can spread out his fruit, the, the chaver, and put his vessels there, his tar vessels. Even though the Yamaaret can just stand in his courtyard and reach his hand over and touch it, and he can touch the fruit, you're not afraid. You think that the boundary line is enough for Tumatara purposes. Okay, even to keep an Amma Aretz away, because there's a clear boundary line. So that seems to be a good proof, like Rabbi Yochanan, that it's good enough even for Tumatara. So the Gemara says, Kasha Rav, that's difficult to Rav, because that shows that a boundary line is good enough even for Tumatara. I'm the Rav, I would say to you, Shani Hasam Shinitvasalav Kaganov. No, there's that phrase again, Nitvasalav Kaganov. What the heck are you doing sticking your hand into my yard? Now, so the question is, how is that different? Somehow we have to assume that the case of when you've just got two yards next to each other and a little hedge, okay, you can. it's a little bit different because if they're two yards next to each other, you can say, oops, I overstepped. You know, I don't know. I was playing ball with my kid and I ran to catch the ball or something like that. But a case of like front and back as opposed to side by side, here to be sticking your hand in, you have absolutely no excuse. So you'll be extra careful. And there the boundary line is enough. But somehow in the two fields that are side by side, Rav says the boundary line is not enough. You'll have an excuse, and that's where I will be afraid, at least for Tumantara. So there is again that Nitfa Salav Kigana phrase. Toshma, come in here. Reb Shimon Gamliel Omer, Gago Shechaver, Lemailo Mi Gago Shalama Arts. They were spreading out their fruit on their rooftops. They had flat rooftops. And the rooftop of the Chaver, he's on a higher building than the Amaretz. So for the Amaretz to be able to touch the fruit in the roof of the Chaver, he have to stretch up his hand and go like this. So there's very little excuse, what's your hand doing on my rooftop? Okay, so... Okay, as long as the arm of the Amaretz can't reach there. But if the arm of the Amaretz could reach there, it would be a problem. So Kasha Leb Yochanan, that's typical of Reb Yochanan. There, it sounds like you've got a boundary line where he would have no good excuse, right? What the heck is your hand doing on my rooftop? And nevertheless, if he's theoretically able to reach it, it's a problem. So Rabbi Yochanan said the boundary line is enough to keep the, the Am Haaretz out. And here we see the boundary line is not enough to keep the Am Haaretz out. Even a, even a nice, good boundary line, like a higher rooftop, is not enough to keep the Am Haaretz out. So that's a challenge to Rabbi Yochanan. So Am Lecha Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan would say back to you, Shani Yosem Disei Lishka Mute. No, he's got an excuse. What's his excuse? I'm measuring. I wanted to see how high or how tall your building was. So I was stretching my arm to see how tall your building was. Or Rashi says, another way of reading those words, Rashi says, I was just yawning. I was exercising. <laughs> it's a little bizarre. Okay. It's a pretty weak answer. Here, Rabbi Yochanan says the boundary line is enough. You don't have an excuse. And therefore, I, I assume my fruit is okay. When it's, we're side by side and there's just a little head. But actual rooftop like that, there you could have an excuse. I was measuring the height of your rooftop or something. Anyway, now when you get down to it, it seems like, you know, it's a lot of just the circumstances. They all agree there are cases where you have a good excuse and therefore it's a problem. Cases you don't have a good excuse and therefore it's not a problem. Okay. And, um, and the only case they debate is this case. Is it a case that you could get away with stretching your hand and say and have a good excuse or not? Okay, so now the Gemara says like this. Tashma coming here. Gogo shochaver b'tzad gogo shalamar. Let's say they're side by side, the rooftop. So that's mamish, just like this case. They're side by side. Also chaver shoter sham peros minir sham keli ba'av b'shoter shalamar t'magas l'sham. You can put your fruit there even though the guy can reach it. Okay, so it sounds like we're not afraid he's going to reach over the boundary line. That sounds like that's what it's saying. So kasha l'rav, that's difficult to rav. Rav said the boundary line is enough to keep him out. Um, right, so, um, right, so I'm a little Rav, so Rav would say to you, hold on, let me just check one thing. Um, wait a minute, 
Right, the boundary line is enough, and Rav says the boundary line by Taurus is not enough. So I'm going to Rav, I would say to you, Fine, you're right. This case says that the boundary line is enough. But this case, which is even more extreme, of the rooftops, right? The case of the rooftops here, and here's your fruit, and here's the guy. Right there, Rabbi Shimon Gamliel said that if you can reach it, it's a problem. So clearly there's a debate of Tanayim. Because here it says, if you can reach it, it's not a problem. And this is an easier excuse why you have your hand over. And here it says, it seems to be that it's an easier excuse. And here it says, if you can reach it, it is a problem. So I go like Rabbi Gamliel. Rabbi Gamliel is more prepared to see problems in these cases than the Tanakhama, and that's what I say. So, okay, that was a series of various cases by Tumantara, whether we say, do you have a legitimate excuse? And if you don't have a legit, and if you're, and, um, and, and um, you know, and if you, if you don't, if, if you don't have a legitimate excuse, then we say that the stuff is okay. We're not afraid you're going to reach your harm o- hand over. But if you might be able to come up with a legitimate excuse, it's not good. Anyway, those are cases of Tumantara. It's another set of applications of Nitzvah Kaganov. And again, what's interesting Interesting is the parallels that we see between concerns of like we had Suffolk Maga of entering into a Shita Rabin, Suffolk Bia, did you become Tame? Did you know cases of an Ama Aretz tucking your fruit, a non Jew tucking your wine, all these types of Tumantara getting mixed up with the Stam Yenam issues? Okay, and this other question about are we somehow more assume that it's easier? To the, 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 well, let me say it again, that the Tumantara is a weightier area than Yenesech, and we're more prepared to say there's a Tumantara problem than, than Yenesech problem. That's at least what Rav said. Rabbi Yochanan did not agree to that. But for Rav, if something is okay from Tumantara concerns, it's certainly going to be okay for Yenesech concerns. So those were fascinating comparisons. But bottom line, the upshot of all of this, as Gloria said, is you get from the case of our Mishnah, where there are limited cases where we are okay, and there are problems cases even with sealed barrels, which are going to be not good, to a whole range of cases of open barrels and somebody with froth in their hands and all these various types of cases where we're much more prepared to say, come up with explanations about why we are assuming that no problem happened. One of them being this idea of Suffolk Bia, which is like this double doubt. You know, maybe it was a Jew, maybe it was a non-Jew, even if it was a non-Jew, maybe they were looking for money, they weren't looking for wine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay? But two key principles to leave with Again, is this about Israeli Shamute and Nitzvah Kigana? If somebody, if they're caught, is going to get in trouble, then we say that we assume that they are did not do anything wrong because they don't want to get in trouble. That's the key of Nitzvah Kigana, and that's probably what's been the key in our Mishnah. When you leave and the non is afraid that you could come back at any minute, and if you came back at any minute, he'd be in trouble, that's the Nitzvah Kigana. Okay, and a related issue was this Isle Nishkamute. With Nitzvah Kaganov, he has a right to be there. Will he get in trouble if he's uh, caught with his hand in the tiller, his hand in the wine? Isle Nishkamute is he doesn't have a right to be there. And again, opposite the way I was saying it earlier, it's a little, it's a little the reverse of what you would have expected. If he's got an excuse to be there, then it's more of a problem. Then he feels more secure and he doesn't feel rushed. If he doesn't have an excuse to be there and he's there anyway, so while you could think that the issue there is that that's an evidence that he's up to not good, then we say that he's feeling rushed and anxious or whatever, and therefore you're actually less concerned that he handled the wine. Okay? So let's just read. I know it's already 8.30, but I want to just read this next mission because it really is just, it's a tiny little piece and it just ends the earlier discussion. Question? Yeah. Do those two principles show up any place else other than in this... You know, Other than by Yayin. Well, we had Nitras Kaganov applied by Tumantara um, just here, right? Yeah. That was exactly this case about the, the, the adjoining yards. Whether it applies elsewhere, I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, I assume you could imagine it applying in general kashras areas and supervision areas, because a lot of what we're learning, Nichnas Viyote and all those types mm-hmm. of things, are principles that are used for general issues of kashras supervision. Um, but normally, kashras supervision, the guy's got a right to be there, and you want to make sure that they're doing the right thing, that they're following mm-hmm. the guidelines you set. Here's the point is that you don't want the guy anywhere in the area, and you, you know, you don't want them there, you don't want them touching your stuff. Uh, I'd have to take a look. I would not be at all be surprised that they would, because they are general sounding principles of when do we have to be concerned, you know, about certain mm-hmm. types of behavior. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if they do get applied elsewhere, but I'd have to check.
All right, let's just read the next little piece. So this is like these troops, okay? And, um, you know, they're sort of, um, uh, and the, the, the word boleshet, it means, Rashi says, it comes from the word to search out. Like, they're, they're, in, they're, they're coming into a town, and they're also, like I said, confiscating food, and, you know, it's in the middle of a battle. Okay, so if they come in at the time of peace, then, and they've got time, to, they're not rushing, running away from the uh, from the enemy. Then the open barrels are all forbidden because you assume they opened them and they helped themselves to the wine, or if they or even, or if they, even if they were previously open, you figured they helped themselves to the wine. But the closed ones obviously are okay. Bishat milchama. If, however, in the middle of they're fighting a battle, okay, then they're all permissible because they don't have a chance to lenasech. Now, it doesn't mean they don't have a chance to lenasech, but they do have a chance to drink the wine. I mean, even if they're running away from the enemy, Adaraba, they're running away from the enemy. They're exhausted. They're they're thirsty. They're hungry. They'll help themselves to wine if they see it. So it, that would be fascinating if the meaning of this were. Even if we're concerned that they might have drunk the wine, it's not a problem because they're not they're not focusing on doing nisuch. That would create a situation which a non who could handle wine, but not in the context where we just say their mind. I mean, we had that a little bit in the previous parak, right, where they handled it and it was incidental and they didn't mean to handle it, and we say it wasn't done in a nisuch type of a context. That's a little like the Mishnah sounds like. It sounds like even if we think they drank the wine, they're too distracted to do nisuch and the wine remains okay. That would be really interesting, especially if we're saying it was okay even to drink, let alone, to, you know, not just to get hana'ah. Let's take a look at the Gemara. For Amini, I'll ask you on this. If a city has been surrounded by a siege, it's been laid in siege, you have to assume that the non-Jews who are besieging the city, when they entered into the, are entering into the city and they're raping the women, and therefore all of the wives of Kohanim are forbidden, because even if it was a rape, the wife of a Kohen who had sex with a non-Jew even through an act of rape is forbidden. So you see that here it's in the middle of a war, Okay, and even though it's in the middle of a war, presumably they are uh, finding enough time to rape the women. Okay, so the Gemara says, Amarav Mari, Lenasech Ein Penai, Livol Yesh Penai, which is lovely, I guess a lovely thing to end on. Okay, they're too distracted to do a vote Zara, but for sex, you know, for rape, I mean, not exactly sex, whatever, rape, everybody, you know, if you look at Rashi, Rashi says, they're too busy fighting the war to take out time to do a little libation to their gods. There, there's a more powerful urge, uh, you know, which all of this I find is, is very, whatever, disturbing slash fascinating. Like, you know, if they're, whatever, if they're in the middle of, of raping, if they've actually conquered the city and therefore they're raping the women, then they've got time to do the nisuch as well. And if they haven't conquered the city, are they raping the women before they've conquered the city? So anyway, I don't really get a lot of this, but uh, but it is quite fascinating in terms of the um, in terms of the sort of assumptions that it's making, and particularly as far as our issue about the wine assumption is, is it basically saying that uh, what do you call it? That even if um, that even if they definitely touched it, it's not a problem if we assume that they didn't do nisuch. Seems to be what's being said. All right, Sorry, here. no, it's okay. I went over. <sighs> See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. <laughs>